So in this episode, we're going to be going over the Bitcoin white paper. This was written by Satoshi Nakamoto, and it completely changed the game for cryptocurrencies. So you might be wondering, why are we going back to the white paper? Why am I using the white paper as a template to understand Bitcoin? Surely there's better resources online. And you'd be right. There's better resources online. The issue that I have with taking secondhand sources is that this process can be repeated many times over. And when you do that too many times, you start to get um, explanations which aren't tied to the original truth. Like this white paper really sets and articulates new perfectly the principles which Bitcoin operates from. And so like, why do I care about doing this? Why did I choose to do the Bitcoin white paper? It's because I believe that people should do a better job of articulating um, the essence of the projects that they're interested in from the original source. This, in my opinion, has caused a lot of problems in the crypto space because we have people talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and they'll say things like Bitcoin's anonymous. Bitcoin is not anonymous. Bitcoin is pseudo anonymous. And there's a difference. And we'll explain that throughout this episode. When you have people who believe things about cryptocurrency that don't actually reflect the, in, the um, real properties of crypto, of blockchain, you get people saying things that are just stupid. They're just wrong. Um, and this has caused a lot of problems in the space. So what I want to do through this episode is to give you the best possible explanation of Bitcoin that I, that I can. So Satoshi starts this paper off with an abstract. He talks about the idea, the motivation for cryptocurrency. And so the motivation for crypto is he wants to create a peer to peer version of electronic cash that allows people to transact with each other with no financial intermediaries. In essence, that's what Bitcoin is. Okay, so Bitcoin is two things. It's one, it's a, it's a method of securely communicating with one another directly on a peer to peer basis. So I can communicate with John without Sally. I can just directly communicate with John. And this might sound trivial, but on the internet, um, this kind of, um, this kind of interaction, this kind of communication is possible, but, but you're skeptical of the things that John would say. So if John tries to send me money, John can't just send me money because money um, traditionally had just been an, an entry in a database. And so you would have to have somebody else, say Sally, to, to discount that entry, um, to, to discount the money that John is sending me from John's account and then add that to my account. Now the issue with this is we have to trust Sally. And so it's not truly a peer to peer, it's intermediated by Sally, by somebody. Now. This has, Satoshi gives us a few reasons for this. Um, in the introduction, he talks about the um, inherent weaknesses of the trust-based model. Those are his words. So he talks about this idea of non-reversible transactions. This basically just points to the double spending problem where I can pay you and then somebody else. And that would be an exploit on the, um, that would be an exploit on the, um, the payment system. Well, it's not possible in all circumstances. It is possible in some circumstances because it's possible in some circumstances um, and there's an actual service that needs to take place. This increases the transaction cost of doing business um, or, or transacting with somebody. So it costs more money now to transact. But also um, he says that it cuts off the possibility for small casual transactions and that there's a, a broader a loss in the cost there, I'm sorry, my bad. There is a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services, which again points to that double spending problem. Um, you can't be certain that transactions are going to um, be immune from exploit. And so he wants to solve this. There is also a, a couple of other motivations, which I don't think are, are directly articulated here, which are, um, if I can communicate with you that is a very um, that allows us to have this sort of decentralized and distributed um, communication network which is naturally more censorship resistant so throughout this this document focuses on the technicals but there's clear properties of blockchain that we can sort of extrapolate from this so naturally if i can if i can communicate directly with you then sally loses whatever power she has over our interaction Okay, so Satoshi 
in the second paragraph of the introduction, Satoshi talks about basically what is needed in an electronic payment system is based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. So Satoshi creates a system which is which allows individuals to communicate with one another based on cryptography and not trust. And so this is kind of a cool this is kind of a cool idea that trust is 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 um, trust is is foundational to what it means to be um, to, to be a human in an economic environment. If I trust you, I can do business with you. If I can't trust you, then I'm going to have to verify every minute step to, to make sure I'm not exploited. And so it's it's inefficient to have systems that have a high trust barrier. So Satoshi points out, look, if we can get rid of this trust barrier, we'll make the system more efficient. And so in an essence, that's that's what that's what he's doing here. And we're going to use cryptography specifically to go ahead and eliminate that trust. He says here, quote, transactions that are computationally impractical to reverse would protect sellers from fraud and routine escrow mechanisms could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem. This was the problem that prevented previous cryptocurrencies from being created, or some of them, by using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. All right, a lot there, but let's break it down. Double spending problem. This says, hey, if I pay you, theoretically, I can pay somebody else as well with that money, and that would be an exploit on the system. Next key term, peer-to-peer -peer distributed. I'm interacting with John directly without Sally's need to intermediate the transaction. Timestamp server. So look, we're going to go ahead and, and get a, a chronolog chronological order of these transactions so that we can be certain who's interacting with who and at what time intervals they're interacting. From this, we can tease out um, an idea of truth. We're going to go ahead and computationally prove this order um, using an algorithm, which we'll get into later. The time, the, and he says the next part, the system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than cooperating group of attacker nodes. So this last sentence, Satoshi is just saying, look, let's, we're going to use cryptography to make a system where people can communicate directly with each other without the need for a bank, without the need for a payment processor. The system itself will be the payment processor. That's a cool idea. He ends this by saying, this system will work, according to him, as long as honest nodes control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attacker nodes. All right, so let's go ahead. I think we covered all that. Let's go on to this next section, transactions. All right, so in this next section, transactions, Satoshi gives um, his definition of what an electronic coin is. And this is a cool idea. So he says, we define an electronic coin as a chain of digital signatures. Each owner transfers the coin to the next by signing a hash of the previous transaction and the public key of the next owner and adding this to the end of the coin. Okay, so this is a cool idea. A payee can verify the signatures to verify the chain of ownership. So. Satoshi's saying, instead of having money be an entry in a database, why don't we have money be, say, some value? But also, let's have that money be the, the record of ownership. So the coin itself, the money itself, if I pay John, okay, what I do is I take a coin and I use my, my uh, say, like a, kind of like a password, which is called a private key, to go ahead and and um, send that to, to 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 send that to John, and I sign this with my my private key, and John can go ahead and verify that um, I in fact did send that to him, and so the coin is the record of ownership. Now, there's a problem with this. Satoshi points this out. The problem, of course, is that the payee can't verify that one of the owners did not double spend the coin. And then he goes back and says, a common solution to introduce, a common solution to this is to introduce a trusted authority or mint that checks every transaction for double spending. After each transaction, the coin must be returned to the mint to issue a new coin, and only coins issued directly from the mint are trusted not to be double spent. The problem with this solution is that the fate of the entire money system depends on the company running the mint with every transaction having to go through them, just like a bank. 
We need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any earlier transactions. For purposes, the earliest transaction is the one that counts, so we don't care about later attempts to double spend. The way to confirm the absence of a transaction is to be aware of all transactions. In the mint-based model, the mint was aware that transactions the mint was aware of all transactions and decided which arrived first. To accomplish this, without a trusted party, transactions must be publicly announced, and we need a system for participants to agree on a single history of the order in which they were received. The payee needs proof that at the time of each transaction, the majority of nodes agreed that it was the first received. So Satoshi says, hey, look, okay? In this transaction section, Satoshi's saying, the problem is that even if we go ahead and um, have this chain of digital ownership that we create through signing, the problem is we can't be certain that people didn't sign the same two, two transactions. And so I could pay John and Sally, reverse the payment, quote unquote, or, um, but then get like a non-reversible service, so good or service. So I can get value without spending money. But he says there is a solution to this, and the solution is that we need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any transactions. In order to accomplish this, what we need is for participants to be able to agree on a history. And so in this system, we're going to just look at the first transact, the first signing event, and that's going to be the one that counts. So if I send a coin to John and then I want to send it to Sally, well, because it happens in the same block time, in the same block uh, time interval, um, the coin's just going to go to John. It's not going to go to Sally. If I send it to Sally first and then try to send it to John, it would just go to Sally, not to John. So Satoshi's so solution to this is to use a timestamp server. Now, the third section of the paper is dedicated to that. What is a timestamp server and how does it work? So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and use this particular function called a hash function. And a hash function is kind of like like hash, like it's just, uh, you know, you've hash, blah, blah, blah. fuck that, all right, restart. The third section is dedicated to explaining the solution to creating a chronological order of transactions. We do this through a timestamp server. A timestamp server works by taking a hash of a block of items to be timestamped and widely publishing the hash. That's a quote from Satoshi in the paper. He says, the timestamp proves that the data must have existed at that time, obviously in order to get the hash. Each timestamp includes the previous timestamp in its hash forming a chain, with each additional timestamp reinforcing the ones before it. So Satoshi's saying that we're going to go ahead and take a block, which we can think of as just a collection of items or a collection of transactional bits of data transactions. We're going to take that and we're going to go ahead and put all this data into a hash and we're going to get a hash code from that. Now that hash code is going to be distributed widely. We're going to publish the hash to everyone in the network so everyone in the network can see, hey, this hash was created at this time. When we do that, we're verifying that the transactions must have existed at that time in order to get the hash. The reason that this is um, can be like a, a valid thing is because a hash function only allows you to um, like like it's very difficult. A hash function is what we would call a one-to-one -one function. A hash function is what we would call a trapdoor function. So a trapdoor function takes some input and it gets and it gives you an output. But it's it's very quick to create an output from an input to take random transaction data and to get a unique code for that data, it's very hard to tease out what the data was to create the unique code. And because of this property of hash functions, this allows us to be probabilistically certain that the transactions did in fact happen in this particular order. And the probability is very high. So this is Satoshi's solution. The next section is about proof of work. And proof of work is the particular way that the network is secured. So proof of work uses miners, which are the participants running proof of work. 
they secure the network. And so what does that mean? So Satoshi says, to implement a distributed timestamp server on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, we need to use a proof-of-work system similar to Adam Back's Hashcash. The proof-of-work involves scanning for a value that when hashed, such as with SHA-256, the hash begins with a number of zero bits. The average work required is exponential in the number of zero bits required. In the, in, this can be verified by executing a single hash. All right, so there's a lot here. Let's break this down. What Satoshi's talking about here is the proof-of-work algorithm. So proof-of-work is the system where we have miners securing the network. But what does that really mean? Like, how does that actually work? Well, anyone who's in the network that wants to um, help secure it is going to get a reward. And we call that reward block reward. So you may have heard the term miners. Miners are just participants in proof of work. This functions by having miners solve some computational problem to secure the network. But like, what does that actually mean? So in order to do this, we kind of need to understand hashes. And what a hash is, hash function takes some stuff and it gives you a unique code for that stuff. Now it's really easy to get the code from the stuff. It's not easy to get the stuff from the code. So if we have every single miner that is able to produce hash functions based on the transactional data, but we want to make sure that they spend a certain amount of electricity, how do we make that happen? Well, what if we added a criteria in here where we have all this transactional data plus a parameter that they can move up or down to change the hash code. And now what if we impose some criteria on this where we're, or impose a constraint where we're saying the hash must be less than some number. So what we have now is an exponentially increasing difficulty function. So as we increase the number of zero bits in front of the hash, we make it exponentially more difficult for people to find the hash. How do you do this? You iterate this number in the um, block to go ahead and explain what's, what's happening. This allows us to have a meritocratic sense of truth in the network. What this means is that the more computational power you have, the more money you've spent on the network, the higher stake you have in securing the network, the more power you have in establishing and maintaining the ledger of truth for the network. Now that we're talking about the network, Satoshi's next, next section is the network. So he says there's six steps to running the network. We'll go over six, all six, and we'll explain each one. So the first step is transactions are broadcast to all nodes. Now, how does this work? All right, say I have a transaction, you have a transaction. Um, we go ahead and transact. A miner will go ahead and facilitate that transaction, take the transactional data, send it out to all the other nodes. Each node collects new transactions into a block. Each node works on finding a difficult proof of work for its block, and that difficulty is adjusted by something called the difficulty parameter, and that can be increased or decreased, which increases or decreases the number of zero bits, which makes it more or less expensive to be a miner on the network. When a node finds a proof of work, it broadcasts the block to all nodes. Nodes accept the block if all transactions in it are valid and not already spent. Nodes express their acceptance of the block by working on creating the next block in the chain using the hash of the accepted block as the previous hash. Nodes always consider the longest chain to be the correct one and will keep working on extending it. If two nodes broadcast different values of the next block simultaneously, some nodes may receive one or the other first in that case, just the first one they receive is, is the valid one. So how does this work? Basically, this first step talks about transactions being broadcast. We know how that works. Each node collects transactions into a block. That's simple enough. Three, each node works on finding a difficult proof of work. That's the mining process controlled by the difficulty parameter. Four, when a node finds a proof of work, it broadcasts the block to all nodes. So when if i'm trying to do the proof of work and i find the proof of work that's say, say a hash below the particular value that it needs to be say with the number of required zero bits then i can go ahead and send that to everybody and i claim my reward as long as i was the first to do it in bitcoin that's how the bitcoin blockchain works nodes accept the block if it's valid and not and the, the transactions aren't already spent so that's the whole solution to the double spending problem how do we do that 
Well, we basically have a coin. In, U in Bitcoin, this is how it works, is you have something called the UTXO model, and that, spends for unspent, that stands for unspent transaction output. And so the way this works is you have a coin, and you'll have, um, say this is like 0.4. This is a value that you have. And you need to send somebody 0.3. So what you'll do is you'll send them 0.4 and they'll send you back 0.3. So this is this process is facilitated by miners, but it's peer-to-peer -peer essentially. Now the unspent transaction output, that is the part of the transaction which you did not spend but was an output. Okay? So this is how values accrued in the network. And so if we have a transaction with inputs that are greater than its outputs, those inputs, the difference is sent back to the person. Um, if we have a transaction which, out, which outputs are bigger than its inputs, we know that's an invalid transaction because we're creating money out of thin air. All right. That is the fifth step in the network. So the sixth step is basically nodes express their acceptance of the block by working on creating the next block. So if they say, hey, everything's valid, what they're incentivized to do is work on the next block so that they can hopefully find the correct hash first that's below that difficulty parameter and hopefully make money. So you have a competitive incentive um, to go ahead and, and not overdo work that's already been done, but to work on the next thing, the most efficient thing. There is inefficient steps to the blockchain, but, but this is not exactly an inefficient one. The next section is about incentive. So by convention, the first transaction in the block is a special transaction that starts a new coin owned by the creator of the block. We've talked about this a little bit, but um, this transaction is basically a reward. So if you go ahead and you solve that that hash, you find that hash which is below the difficulty parameter first, you get a reward. This would be like um, mining rewards. So this is the incentive to be a miner. That reward decays over time so that the total supply of Bitcoin will reach around 21 million Bitcoins. Now there's another part where if there's extra, the, the miners also have the ability to collect a fee under certain circumstances. If the output value of a transaction is less than the input value, the difference is a transaction fee that is added to the incentive value of the block containing the transaction. So even after these block rewards end, people will still have an incentive to keep going, to keep producing blocks, because they get a transaction fee. That's how we're going to pay the miners once the block rewards run out. The seventh is on reclaiming disk space. So once the latest transaction, the coin, is buried under enough blocks, we're going to go ahead and use something called a Merkle tree to go ahead and secure this. So, all right, so how does, how does, how does a Merkle tree work? So let's imagine that we hash all of our transactions. And we'll say, say we have like five transactions, four transactions. Okay. So I have transaction one, two, three, four. Now I convert all these four transactions into a hash. So now I have four transaction hashes. And what I want to do is I, I want to condense these. So what I can do is take a hash of these two and make that one transaction hash and then hash these two into another transaction hash. And then what I can do is, trans is hash both these into another one. So I can condense the whole thing, keep preserve all the all the information here into one particular hash and this can represent all of the transactions since if you have all the transactions you'll produce that hash but it's very difficult probabilistically unlikely that you'll be able to get the hash without having the transactions so satoshi says this is going to save a bunch of space all right simplified payment verification so he says look now if we have this merkle root thing we're going and condensing all the hashes. We've got just this one hash, which we're gonna put in the block, which is the, the sequence of time that divides each particular transaction history interval. Um, he says, look, like, all you need to verify stuff is um, you just need to look at the longest chain of proof of work, and you can get, by, you can get that by querying nodes until 
a particular user is convinced that they have the longest chain and obtain the Merkle branch linking the transaction to the block it's timestamped in. He can't check the transaction for himself, but by linking to it in the place in the chain, you can see the network node has accepted it. And blocks added after it further confirm the network has accepted it. So he's just saying, you know, you can query a bunch of nodes until you find the longest chain, which is the definition of the, the tr collective truth in this, in this system. And a user can check transactions by linking to it in a place in the chain. Um, he can see that the network has accepted it and that blocks added after it further confirm the network has accepted it. The verification is reliable as long as the majority of honest nodes control the network. This is probabilistic, but it is more vulnerable if the network is overpowered by an attacker. While network nodes can verify transactions themselves, simplified payment method can be fooled by an attack attacker's fabricated transactions. One strategy is to protect this against a bunch of different um, to accept alerts from network nodes if they detect an invalid block, prompting the user's software to download the full block and alter transactions to confirm the inconsistency. Basically, he's saying, um, yeah, basically you can do this without having the full blockchain, but if you want to have the full blockchain, it's probably a little more secure. Businesses might want to do that so they can get so quick, quicker security and quicker verification. Be sorry, better security and quicker verification. We already went over the UTXO model, which is combining and splitting value. Um, this basically just states this is a change model. So I pay with you with a dollar for a 75 cent apple, and you're going to pay me back 25 cents. That's how UTXOs work. Now, in Bitcoin, we don't have complete anonymity. We have something called pseudo anonymity. And so this works by using public private key pairs. Now, a public private key pair, you can think of like a, a username and a password. But what is it actually? So a private key is a very big prime number. And from that private key, you can derive a public key. And the public key you can share with everyone. The public key is an address in physical cyberspace. Or is an address, a location in cyberspace that people can send stuff to. And you can access the contents that are sent to those locations via your 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 private key. So the private keys, the controlling, the public keys are the locations. In the traditional world, we're relying on trusted parties to keep everything private. But in the new privacy model, the pseudo anonymous privacy model, your identity is separated from your transactions. And so the public can see your transactions, but they can't link to you. And the last part um, it's not going to be too in-depth, but it simply um, shows you, and I would, I would encourage you to look at this on your own, but um, it goes over how an attacker would try to take over the network. And um, I, would, I would highly recommend reading it, but it's a little bit outside the scope of just understanding the basics of Bitcoin, so we'll be... Um, skipping that today and jumping just straight to the conclusion. So Stoshi says, we've proposed a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust. We started from the usual framework of coins made from digital signatures to provide enough control, ownership, and authentication. So we're using cryptography to go ahead and create a system where we can communicate in a new way. And we're permanently instantiating that communication on a ledger, a permanent record that expands through time. This is a robust system where participants can leave and join again. And there's just some amount of people, consistent users, which can cycle in and out. And the system can outlive the members of the system. In this way, it has a property of emergence. People vote with their CPU power, not with their IP addresses. And they express their acceptance of particular things in the network through meritocratic means. It's meritocratically mediated. And we can sh we can enforce rules via the consensus mechanism. All right. So thank you for watching this video, listening to this podcast. Um, I'll see you guys all in the next episode where we will go over um, a different white paper and break it down. Thank you guys. Have a nice day.